So my name is Robert. I'm a staff software engineer at Decodable. We are building um, a SaaS offering for Apache Flink in the cloud. It's um, mostly SQL, like Flink SQL, but also um, you can upload your Flink jars and we run them for you. And um, let me first introduce quickly what Apache Flink is. The website says stateful computations over data streams. So it means you can connect to a bunch of different systems um, like Kinesis, Pulsar, and most popular Kafka. You can also do um, change data capture uh, from Postgres or MySQL, where you're basically getting events for every change that you're doing in the database. And then this stream of event, events goes into a cluster of um, uh, Flink processes, which are processing your data in real time um, with low latency. And the stateful computations basically means that you can, for example, build session windows or aggregations or basic filtering or mapping or lookups and so on um, as part of your Flink cluster. And um, Flink is highly scalable, so you can add more machines. It will um, have higher throughput. You can, uh, it supports exactly once processing semantics, which means that um, for registered state, so for example, for your session windows or for your um, aggregations, if the system needs to restore and replay parts of your data, it will reset your state accordingly so that um, the aggregations or the window contents um, are accurate exactly once. It supports event time semantics and watermarking for handling time, for handling, uh, for providing correct results even under back pressure or um, system outages. And you can use all these features um, with different APIs. There is a spectrum of APIs from streaming SQL, which is very easy to use. You just write like a few lines of uh, pretty much standard SQL, and then this generates a Flink job for you. Or you use the more low-level data stream API in Java, Scala, Kotlin, also Python, um, which is much more expressive. You have much more access to low-level primitives in Flink. Um, to use all these features like event time, exactly once, and so on. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about minimizing Flink, like reducing the resource footprint of Flink, in particular um, the memory footprint, and I will also look at the resource consumption that you will have on running, uh, um, sorry, not the resource consumption, the performance um, numbers, like the throughput and so on that you have when running a really small Flink cluster. And the first motivation here on this slide is um, that the, the minimum cluster size that you um, need to have when you deploy a Flink cluster is roughly 1.7 gigabytes of memory if you're using the default configurations of Flink and like the Kubernetes operator of Flink to deploy it. And that's because the job manager needs like 650 megabytes and the task manager or multiple task managers each need um, one gigabyte of um, main memory. And this is also this motivation is also the reason why I'm why I've worked uh, on this at my job because we have customers that have hundreds of streams that they want to process and these streams have fairly low throughput. And if these customers would launch like a hundred Flink clusters, it would not be feasible for them to use Flink in production with like Flink SQL. Um, because they would have too high costs to process their data. And that's why we were looking into reducing the resource footprint of Flink as much as we can so that these customers can also use um, Flink for their low throughput streams uh, in our product. The second motivation is also when you're deploying Flink internally and you have um, like low throughput use cases and you want to have Flink deployed in a unified way alongside your other microservices like your Spring applications, your Quarkus um, applications, and you want to have like a unified deployment monitoring and operations um, for these services. So basically, you're considering everything a JVM, and you want to have Flink also deployed as a single JVM that reads data from Kafka or Pulsar, uh, is analyzing it and writing some results somewhere. And the third motivation for um, trying to make Flink as small as possible is local development and testing. You want to run Flink in your IDE so that you can test whether the code that you just wrote um, compiles and um, makes sense, or you want to run integration tests um, to make sure that your analysis is correct. So you don't want to have, you don't want to live in the data center when implementing a Flink application. The third case is actually covered 
let's say automatically in Flink. So there is when you when you just initialize a streaming like a stream execution environment in Flink, it will automatically launch a mini cluster when you're running Flink from your main method. And there's also a JUnit rule that you can use to um, create a mini cluster um, in Flink unit tests. So this is actually already covered, but the first two cases are not really covered in the Flink documentation. And in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit how to um, get started. Before we do that, we'll quickly talk about the deployment options of Flink. Um, nowadays, most people are using Kubernetes. Um, and the blue line basically shows what I think is the preferred way to deploy Flink with the standalone mode, which means you're posting um, some resource definitions to um, Kubernetes, like um, for the job manager and for the task manager processes. And then um, these processes come up, connect to each other, and Flink will figure out how to distribute work amongst these JVMs. There's also the option to use the native Kubernetes mode, um, where you submit a job manager to Kubernetes, and this job manager needs a service account that has the permission to create um, pods. So the job manager will actually decide how many pods to allocate depending on the jobs that you're submitting to Flink. So with the native mode, you have more resource elasticity because Flink can allocate and deallocate pods um, throughout the life cycle, basically, of a Flink cluster. But it requires um, lots of access in your Kubernetes cluster because it needs to have the permission to launch pods, uh, which might not be OK for some environments. There's also the option to launch uh, Flink on Docker. You can also build stuff yourself um, using the best scripts provided by just launching the JVMs that you need. And um, there's the option to deploy Flink using Minicluster, and that's what this talk is about. So to just get started with an empty Flink cluster that doesn't run anything, you basically need to run these few lines of codes in your, let's say, main method or somewhere else. Um, this will start all the services that you would also start in a distributed cluster. So it's bringing up the job manager, it's bringing up a task manager, a resource manager. Um, the task managers will connect to the job manager. I mean, they will connect uh, just locally. There's no network involved. Um, and other projects have um, similar utilities. For example, there's a class called the Kafka server in the Kafka project that allows you to launch a Kafka broker locally. Or there is the mini DFS cluster um, in the Apache Hadoop file system. So if you want to launch HDFS locally, you can also just um, call, them, call this class. It gets tricky when you're trying to launch like HDFS, Kafka, and Flink in the same JVM just because of um, class path issues. So better use something like test containers if you have multiple systems. So when you run this main method and you try to get the heap size down, it won't work with a heap limit of 60 megabytes. It did work with a heap limit of 65 megabytes, but I wanted to go even lower. And that's why I reduced the memory configuration of Flink um, to 8 megabytes. So Flink will only allocate 8 megabytes um, of memory buffers instead of 64 megabytes. And with that, I was able to launch an empty Flink cluster with a heap limit of 20 megabytes, which I think is quite good, like it would run on my Apple Watch. Um, so we can launch Flink with 20 megabytes of heap space, but there are some open questions. Um, what is the, what is the um, heap size when you run an actual job on this cluster? What's the throughput that you can get from such a small process? And why is there such a discrepancy between the 20 megabyte of heap and the 80 megabyte of JVM process size as reported by the operating system? And for the remainder of this talk, I will go through these items. So the first item is to um, launch an actual Flink job on this cluster. And I will um, use a sim fairly simple job, which has just a Kafka source reading from a Kafka topic, a filter operation, which is filtering out 1% of the data, and a Kafka sync. And um, when I run this job on the cluster, I need to add 15 more megabytes to the heap so that it doesn't fail immediately. The process size goes up to 190 megabytes on average, like this is fluctuating. Um, some caveats, checkpointing is not enabled, and I'm not using RocksDB, so I'm just using like on heap state, which is fine because the only state that this job has are some offsets from the um, Kafka source for reading data. 
And also, I have to say, um, I'm going to do some benchmarks, and um, I'm not really deserializing the data. So I'm treating every incoming and outcoming data just as a string. I'm not trying to like deserialize the JSON or something, which would add more CPU cycles um, to this um, experiment. So for the benchmark, I'm going to run three mini clusters. Um, the top left one is a mini cluster that is generating data to Kafka. Then there is a mini cluster that I want to benchmark that runs this very simple Flink pipeline. And this writes again to Kafka. And then there's a final mini cluster, which is just measuring how fast is data being written to this Kafka cluster. And I'm running this on this very MacBook, so it's not a very professional benchmarking setup because, you know, I have a browser open and stuff. Um, but I still think it gives you a rough indication of what to expect from such a small Flink process um, on a single machine. So here are my results. With the 35 megabyte heap limit that I had initially for getting this to run, it was actually failing almost immediately. Like with three megabytes of data per second, um, the JVM was already failing with an out-of-memory exception. I guess that it was just allocating um, stuff on the heap too fast, so the garbage collector was not able to clean up fast enough under such high um, memory pressure. With 50 megabytes, I got it to like 25 megabytes of throughput. And with a heap limit of 100 megabyte, I got it to roughly 100 megabyte um, of throughput per second on this laptop. Um, so let's look a little bit at the details. Um, this is from the visual JVM utility. Um, so with a 50 megabyte heap limit, I had this run for like 10, 15 minutes, and I was increasing the data generator speed. So initially, I was uh, generating data with 6 megabytes, then 12, 25. And at 36 megabytes, I think I put too much pressure on the JVM. It failed. Um, so, I can, so we can just conclude somewhere between 25 and 36 megabytes is the limit for a 50 megabyte heap limit um, for running this really small Flink cluster. So I doubled the limit. And then the JVM was stable. You can see on the right-hand side that there is not much room left in the garbage collector, like 30% left or so, but it still looks healthy. Like You see that the garbage collector activity on the left-hand side is super low, like it's a flat line. I would be worried if you would spend like 20 or 30% of your CPU time just on garbage collection, but that's not the case here. So I think the um, limit is somewhere else, probably in the Kafka, uh, like in the local Kafka broker or so. But I think 100 megabytes per second is a pretty decent uh, throughput for such a small process. So if you imagine running this as a um, microservice in your Kubernetes cluster for analyzing some data, I think that's pretty decent. Um, if you add checkpointing, you might need a few more megabytes of heap. Um, and if you're doing like more serialization or so, then you would probably also need more CPU resources, but I'm mostly focusing on memory in this case. So as I mentioned, um, there is a bit of a difference between the heap limit and the real memory allocation that the operating system is reporting. So for the 100 megabyte heap limit, I saw the memory consumption roughly around 250, 260. Um, megabyte, like when you use top and you look at the RSS um, or like real memory in the Mac OS uh, activity tool, um, then you see roughly 250 megabytes. So I enabled this JVM native memory tracking. Um, I've put the JVM argument here. Then you need to call some J command. And um, with that, I got this analysis. So basically when the whole memory goes up is when I started the data generator. And um, what you see is that like 100 megabyte is heap and the rest is stuff, like stuff from the JVM. For example, the thread space, like for each thread, there is one megabyte um, of uh, stack um, space allocated. The garbage collector has 50 megabytes. Metaspace has 50 megabytes. So Metaspace is basically um, all the classes that you're loading. They are basically loaded into a separate area in the JVM called the Metaspace. This is never garbage collected, it's allocated forever. The garbage collector is just metadata for the garbage collector where it s stores basically the um, age information about the object sensor on the graph, I guess. Anyways, so this looks pretty bad in my opinion because the majority of um, memory is um, spent on JVM metadata. So there's this really nice blog post linked here and in that blog post, um, there are some 
tips how to reduce the um, native memory allocation uh, of a JVM. And what I did is I reduced the th uh, thread stack size from one megabyte to 256 kilobytes. And with that, I was able to drastically reduce the allocated memory for the threads. And I also switched um, from the default garbage collector, which is like the G1 GC, to the serial garbage collector. And that basically zeroed the memory consumption um, of the garbage collector. But of course, this is reducing the throughput. So I was doing some experimental benchmarks, and it looks like 15 megabytes or so uh, of performance hit because the garbage collector is le less efficient. And also reducing the thread um, uh, stack size is also dangerous because you might run into um, stack overflow exceptions because there's less space for the threads uh, for the yeah for the thread threads to allocate. Um, and Flink has a high number of threads, so it has like around 100 threads in this experiment, um, 20 of which are for um, like the REST API of Flink. So you can probably also optimize this by reducing the number of threads in this pool to like two instead of 20. So there's more room to optimize. Um, but to conclude my talk, I was able to scale down Flink to a process size of roughly 250 megabytes. Um, and this mini cluster was still able to process 100 megabytes of data per second. These mini clusters run the same code as a fully distributed cluster. So you are able to migrate your state and everything, your jobs, from this mini cluster to a full distributed cluster if your workload is expanding over time. It supports high availability. So you can kill this mini cluster process. When it comes up, it will look at a config map or a zookeeper and knows how to restore from the latest checkpoint. It supports all the metrics and logging integrations of Flink. It also supports the Flink web UI. So if you're adding the right jar to the glass path, Flink will um, allow you to connect to the 8081 port and you will see um, like the status overview of Flink. And I have a GitHub repository with all the examples from this talk, so you can take the source code and run it yourself. And we have one minute left for questions. Yes, anyone, any questions? Uh, and you can also ask about Flink in general if you want. Yeah. It doesn't have to be about minimizing Flink. So, question from me. The mini cluster is part of Flink, yes? Yes. And you, it still allows you to run Kafka and the others, uh, HDFS, for example, even if it's a Flink uh, offering or a Flink, part of Flink, yes? Yes. So the mini cluster is not really documented documentation, but it's used everywhere in the internal unit tests of Flink. So it's a public class, so you can just use it. And basically, um, Flink supports, as I showed in my presentation, all kinds of deployment modes. And um, these deployment modes have different entry classes to a framework of different, um, let's say, resource managers, job managers, task managers, and so on. So these different entry points are basically different configurations of how to start Flink. And mini cluster is one entry point of how to start Flink. And basically, if you look into the mini cluster class, it's launching all the services that Flink has, like HA, service plugin manager, job manager, and so on. Pretty useful. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps I missed it, but uh, you've clearly explained how to reduce the memory footprint in a quote-unquote empty uh, cluster as an empty job. Um, but I've kind of missed the thing where you um, are only running on one JVM. Because it, in my memory, starting a mini cluster simply starts both the job and the task managers. Yes, but it's OK. Um, so. It starts the job manager and task manager threads, but it's still within the same JVM. Ah, okay. So it's basically one JVM, and then in the JVM we call just the like job manager.start and task manager.start code. But it's not that kind spawning of a hundred thread threads. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You have quite a high threads thread count and like all kinds of stuff allocating memory. Yeah. So I think maybe you should have a separate talk on mini cluster in the future, because that seems like an interesting subject. <laughs> the hope was that this talk is about mini cluster. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the talk. Big round of applause for Robert. <laughs>